In August 1998, I moved from Sydney to Seattle. A little over three months later, I found myself the proud but unskilled owner of a two-month-old Alaskan Malamute pup. For the first few months, I indulged him like any other puppy. Being a Malamute meant that he was going to grow very quickly and would need comfortable amenities to support the size he was destined for. In a single year, he went from a handful of fluff to a Santa Claus-sized armful of love. In a new city and country, there was no better way to meet people than with Bondi at my side. Life continued on as we explored Seattle and surrounds. Just before his third birthday, he nearly died from the condition known as bloat, an ordeal that brought us even closer together. He bounced back from that and mere weeks later was running through the snow again and waving to the neighbours from our upper story windows. In 2002 we took our first road trip around the coast of Washington State, across to Vancouver Island and up to Whistler, returning via Vancouver. Dog-friendly accommodation was plentiful, and Bondi enjoyed all that the host establishments had to offer. A year later, I moved back to Sydney. Bondi quickly became a fixture around the Newtown area, and even the furniture was comfortable enough for him. I decided to try for a longer road trip, so we toured Tasmania for five weeks. This was much harder than it had been in North America, as Australia has very little dog-friendly accommodation. It was time to try a real road trip where dogs would be welcomed. So we headed off to London for 30 months of travel through 30 countries. In our first six months abroad, we did a lot of touring through England, Scotland and Wales, even taking a week to walk across Scotland along the locks past Loch Ness. It was very easy to get around, as dogs could travel on buses, trains and ferries. Interesting people gravitated to Bondi, whatever we were doing. We might have been doing a long walk by the Thames up to Pall Mall, evading Daleks in Norwich, hunting through the back colleges of Cambridge, or even skinny dipping in the North Sea. Then we were off to the continent, a ferry across the Channel, and thence to Amsterdam stops in Lucerne and Genoa, and then a week around Nice and Monte Carlo. We headed west into Spain via Pamplona and went on to Salamanca where we stayed for a month with a host family, me speaking no Spanish, them speaking no English. Then we moved on to San Sebastian where I did further Spanish lessons. Bondi visited the Chateau of the Loire on our exit through France, and later on popped into Mont Saint-Michel. Back in England, I was very happy to find myself a boyfriend who was curiously simpatico with Bondi. In 2006, we spent two months living in central Paris. then six weeks driving around the coast of Ireland. We followed this up with another week of walking along Hadrian's Wall, crossing England from coast to coast. After some more local touring, 
we set off on an ambitious 20,000 km drive through 20 countries. Basically driving from London to Poland via Sicily and coming back over the top of Norway crossing the Arctic Circle twice. All of this in 15 weeks. Through all of these countries we had no trouble finding places to stay. New hearts for Bondi to win. Some days Bondi was my kite, flapping madly behind me. But equally, I was often his kite as he moved confidently across borders. One can only imagine what some border officials at isolated mountain crossings thought on the day that we turned up. A right-hand drive vehicle with British plates, driven by a man with an Australian passport, and a gigantic snow dog hanging out the window. We spent most of our final six months in Scotland, enjoying the Edinburgh Festival and, more notably, the festival enjoying Bondi, before travelling further through the, far north of, through the far north of Scotland to the Orkneys and Western Islands. Once he had achieved his full quotient of cool Britannia, we returned to Sydney. It was now the end of 2007. Bondi spent a month in quarantine before coming home to what would be his place of retirement. After a few months, we were joined by a new pup, Munson, who could have no better example than Bondi and his calm authority. In 2009, Bondi was diagnosed with bone cancer. And despite surgery and a valiant recovery effort, he passed peacefully at home in my arms. He gave me permission to live my life in ways I could not have imagined when he stumbled in my, into my life a decade earlier. My hands have a complete memory of the shape of Bondi's head. They remember the patches at the back of his jaw which I would cup and scratch just the right way, the velvety hairs that cover his ears, the hard spot between brow and muzzle where I would apply two-fingered pressure that, I, that would relieve all pains. As he puts out his paw I can feel the weight, the roughness of the pads against the calluses of my own palms. My fingers remember the hairy tuft behind his elbow. My feet remember the weight of his head when his chin rested on them as I sat at the piano. There are spaces around me with weight and memory and texture. A hot breath next to my ear, reminding me to open the rear car window so that the smells of the open road can be savoured. As surely as Bondi magnified what was in my heart, he taught me more about living and dying than any human. I offer Munson what I instinctively offered Bondi, what any of us would offer a human child in our care. A place to be safe and to be stimulated. To grow in confidence, to know that to offer love is to invite it in return.